Good evening, and welcome to Columbus City Council's Finance Committee's public hearing. I'm Councilmember Priscilla Tyson, and I'm chair of the committee. I am joined by my council colleagues, Councilmember Mitchell Brown, Councilmember Hardin, and Councilmember Page. Before we begin, please be aware that tonight's hearing is being recorded for rebroadcast on CTV, Columbus Governmental Te Government Te Television Channel 3. The rebroadcast schedule will be available at www.columbus.gov. The purpose of tonight's hearing is to allow Columbus residents to offer their perspective on the mayor's 2016 proposed operating budget. The proposal for the general operating fund is $834,800,000. This is a continuation budget. The budget will fund services and programs that are vital to, to the lives of our residents. Further, the public comment hearing promotes transparency. In addition to tonight's hearing, there were eight public hearings held last month on the budget. We want to ensure that people who live in, in the city are aware of the city's finances and how their tax dollars are being invested. As I mentioned, when we begin, began hearings on the budget last month, Columbus is one of the best managed cities in the entire country. We continue to be the largest city in America to receive a AAA bond rating from the three major credit rating agencies. We have streamlined the operation of our government and are on track to saving taxpayers nearly $260 million. We promised our residents in 2009 through efficiencies and reforms we would save money and we have kept that promise. We continue to set aside dollars for the rainy day fund. Last year we put in $2.2 million and this year there's $2 million in the budget. I believe it is important that we continue to highlight these points because it demonstrates that our city is financially stable and has remained so during challenging economic times. I also want to speak to the end of the year carryover funds that will be amended into the budget. As a result of the final financial activity in 2015, the available resources for the city's budget are now estimated at $835,291,000, an increase of $506,000. At the council meeting this coming Monday, February the 1st, the additional $506,000 will be amended in the budget. In the past years, council has used these carryover dollars to, to fund amendments that were reflected in our priorities. However, considering the significant reduction in carryover funds from the, from the past two years, as we, comp as we compile the budget amendments, Council has agreed to follow the course of action that we took last year and make a fiscally responsible decision amending the budget to set aside the additional resources in the already established council funds dedicated to public safety, jobs, and neighborhood services. By setting aside the additional available resources, we will be better prepared for any unforeseen financial challenges in the short term and the midterm. Before starting, I also want to recognize that we have several of our human service partners that will be presenting tonight. We value our human service organizations and the work that they do in serving some, some of our most vulnerable populations. We also have many of the department directors here to answer questions that may come up tonight. I also want to thank them for being here tonight. With that, I will begin calling up presenters. I would like to remind all the presenters this evening that you have three minutes to speak. Before I do that, are there any questions or comments from my council colleagues? Hearing and seeing none, we will start. So we're gonna kind of tee this up so people know who's coming next. So the first speaker is gonna be Janet Bridges. After that will be Anna Worth. And then we'll have Peggy Murphy and then Charles Nabret. So, Ms. Janet Bridges, good evening. Good evening. I'm Janet Bridges with the Community Shelter Board. Your incredible and long standing support of basic human needs has made a significant impact, rebuilding thousands of lives. During the last year, we responded to a significant increase in homelessness among families by opening a new family shelter and increasing diversion efforts. A new task force of key community leaders is being formed to create services to keep families in their homes 
and halt an over-reliance on the emergency shelter system. Thanks to your support, our new system for single adults is showing promising results. Through the Navigator program, we are housing single men and women at a rate of 34 people every week. By developing permanent supportive housing, our community has a major impact in addressing long-term homelessness, saving money for jails, hospitals, and other systems. There are over 3,000 units of supportive housing in our community for people with low incomes. Nearly 2,200 of those units are for people experiencing chronic homelessness. We have brought on 643 units of supportive housing in the last six years alone. Because of our excellent results across the system, the U.S. Department of HUD awarded us $1.5 million to bring on even more units this year. We will continue to work hard to bring these types of federal funds to Columbus. We understand that while homelessness among families has doubled, your resources have not. But you have entrusted us to lead a homeless system that ensures safe emergency shelter and services for Columbus citizens who truly need it. As the voice of 12,000 people experiencing homelessness, we would not be doing our job if we didn't ask for enough funding to meet the growing need. The mayor's proposed budget does not include funding for the street outreach team which looks for people living on the street to help them get to the safety of a shelter or home where they can get the services they need. $117,000 is requested for this critically important service. I want to thank you for your incredible support. You have rolled up your sleeves and served meals and you have spoken out about the need for safe shelter and affordable housing for the most vulnerable citizens of Columbus. Thank you. Thank you, Janet, for coming to council and, and being in support of the budget. And I agree, we certainly need to keep more families in their homes so they're not coming into the system. And um, we understand the shortfall of $117,000 for the street outreach program. So we are all, we're talking about that. Thank you. Thank you for coming down. Anna. Please share your name and... Hi, good evening. My name is Anna Worth and I'm the Director of Healthcare Operations from AIDS Resource Center, Ohio. Today, I'm speaking in favor of the current budget proposal specifically as it relates to the comprehensive harm reduction effort planned to combat the opiate epidemic, epidemic in Central Ohio. Approval of this budget will allow AIDS Resource Center Ohio, ARC Ohio, in conjunction with the Columbus Public Health Department, to continue planning and execute a comprehensive harm reduction program for Central Ohio to address the current opiate epidemic and help prevent a public health crisis. The plan calls for a comprehensive care model that will include intervention encompassing treatment and counseling, HIV, hepatitis C, and STI testing and care, syringe access, and overdose prevention through increased access to naloxone. The program, called SafePoint, is being designed in response to Ohio's increasing opiate epidemic and a new state law that took effect in October, which allows syringe exchange programs to operate with oversight by local public health departments. In 2012, Columbus was one of eight Ohio cities identified as heroin hotspots by the Ohio Department of Health. Columbus is currently the only large city in Ohio without a comprehensive harm reduction program. This program will form part of ARC Ohio's harm reduction strategy, being implemented to reduce the negative consequences associated with drug use, reduce the overall level of drug consumption, and help prevent new HIV and other blood-borne infections. Research by the World Health Organization clearly demonstrates that syringe access programs do not increase drug use. Comprehensive harm reduction programs that include syringe access are a financially sound way to prevent the costly burden of treating HIV and hepatitis C. According to the Centers for Disease Control, the average cost of distributing a clean needle is about 97 cents, compared to the lifetime cost of treating for, treatment for an HIV-positive person 
which is estimated at $379,668. Medication costs to treat a person for hepatitis C can be as much as $100,000. Details of the plan are still being developed, but I can share that ARC Ohio will begin syringe access services this Saturday at our medical center. For more than 30 years, we have worked with marginalized communities that have dealt with the issue of stigma and shame related to health. We are in a unique position to create a program that will help save lives and provide people who inject drugs with a path towards recovery. As a first step towards a more expansive set of harm reduction services, ARC Ohio through its subsidiary, AMC Ohio Pharmacy, was the first public pharmacy in Franklin County to dispense <coughs> Thank you. <laughs> and I'm sorry, I went over. <laughs> That's okay. Thank you for coming down, Anna, in support of the um, harm, our harm reduction program. Thank you. Peggy Murphy. Good evening. Good evening. Thank you again, President Pro Tem Tyson, and everyone for allowing us to come back tonight for our uh, for the budget hearings. Uh, we want to thank the city again for their um, constant support of community gardens in our city. We know that green space is very important. I am here to talk a little bit more about the importance of these gardens in relation to economic development. Uh, Franklinton and American Edition are two examples of how the gardens have uh, went on to improve the economic uh, development of a community. Uh, over, I think, nine, nearly $19 million went into American Edition this past, uh, the past year, and that was through the help of what well, started with a garden uh, that was a, um, it was a place where trashed cars were located, and then from that garden, it seemed like that new economic development sprung up, and the same has happened in Franklinton and we are seeing this happening throughout our city because it, it helps our residents to feel like we are helping from the inside of our communities. And uh, it affects not just economic development, but also education, safety, improved environments, healthier communities, uh, especially in areas where there are no grocery stores. Uh, the Corner Store Initiative has been very helpful and Middle Ohio Food Bank's um, gardens have been extremely helpful in our community, along with what Franklin Park Conservatory is doing and OSU Extension. But we are wanting to uh, seek more funding for what the community can do to help support the gardens that they are creating. And other cities like Cincinnati and Cleveland have been um, moving forward with initiatives on uh, community gardens, urban agriculture, civic gardens, education gardens, and we um, look forward to seeing how we can work together this year and improve the opportunity to, for there to be more funding for gardens in our city. Ms. Murray, Murphy, do you have a dollar amount in mind? Um, I just know that the Highland Youth Garden, we started out with a dollar and a prayer, and we are now operating on about $30,000 per year, uh, educating over 500 children. Uh, Battelle and Straters and OSU Cares have all um, been partners in what, the, what we are doing to make improvements in this community. But other gardens are just starting or they're midway so there's funding that is needed for all of our gardens. Uh, I speak for, um, I'm a past president of the Greater Columbus Growing Coalition. Jody Spencer, our present uh, president, was not able to be here tonight, but we do have uh, Charles Neighborhood here from uh, our vice chair, and then also another member of, our, of the GCGC. As far as a number, um, during the bicentennial year, uh, there was money set aside that really helped transform these neighborhoods. And even though this is not a, um, I mean, a, a, a very important year, to me, it, to all of us it is, with new opportunities. And I think Mayor Genther said, we got to get our sunglasses on because we have a brighter future ahead. 
and um, we're going to need those sunglasses in the garden. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Mur Murphy. Mr. Nabret, good evening. Good evening. My name is uh, Charles Nabret, and I am the uh, new vice president of the uh, Greater Columbus Growing Coalition. I wanted to thank uh, all the council members for their continued support of uh, community gardens here in the city of Columbus. Um, I have been a part of the GCGC for about two years now, um, and in that time I have seen dozens and dozens of additional gardens join. Um, I don't know every story behind each garden, but I can tell you the story of the garden that I work most closely with, which is the uh, Charles Nabret Memorial Garden. Uh, it's named for my father. We started two years ago uh, when he passed uh, due to complications. Um, we started with basically a lot of volunteers, a lot of energy, and uh, no financial support or other ideas in terms of what to start with. We went to GCGC. They were able to give us books on how to start organic gardening, books on square foot gardening, free seeds, uh, and their partnership with the Straters um, Nursery has really helped us, uh, not just with our own growing, but also with passing out and being able to give um, our students and community members something that they can take home and start growing at their actual residence, um, something that's a little more sustainable. Uh, when you create a garden, you are making a safe space in a community, whether you put a sign up that says no guns or not, people feel safe. Uh, the children can sense that. Um, we started just a little over two years ago, and with the help of GCGC, we've been able to continue growing each year. Uh, we started with six classes on basic science in the garden, things like chemistry, um, how to compost, worms are wonderful, and vermiculture. Uh, in those two years since, we've grown to 12 classes, and this year we'll be offering 88 classes uh, in partnership with the um, uh, excuse me, with the um, Franklin Park Conservatory. Uh, we were also named uh, the 2015 Community Garden of the Year. Uh, and this is without really any, you know, city or municipal funding. We did a lot of this with uh, crowdsourcing on social media. Um, if you ask for a dollar amount, we will make every single dollar that you uh, earmark for community gardens count, uh, because this is just one of, like Peggy said, hundreds of stories uh, just within the GCGC, and we're one of several growing coalitions just here in the city of Columbus. Um, I wanted to thank you again for your support and to urge you to continue to think about funding community gardens specifically in the upcoming 2016 food plan. Thank you, and where's your garden located? Our garden is located at 1200 Brentnell Avenue. It's uh, directly behind the Ohio Dominican soccer fields and two doors down from the Brentnell Rec Center. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. Our next speaker is Ms. Ava Johnson. Uh, just to look, oh, never mind, thank you. Mm. you uh, I just want to say, uh, being a part of the uh, GCGC has uh, motivated me to do my own gardening in my own backyard, and how our neighbors are, uh, seem to be very interested in starting their own gardens. And I just think so much can develop you know, out of that if you get people interested, because there's times when my neighbors didn't even say anything uh, to each other. I live in the Old Town East area, um, and it, it, it just brings about a camaraderie and interacting with neighbors again, and it's just a lot of different things that can result from uh, community outreach and community building, and thank you very much. Thank you, and to the three of you, this is certainly a council that believes in community gardening. Uh, council, I think, first funded community gardens. I know we did in the city. And uh, now that I know the mayor's office is now funding it. But it started here yes. and supporting gardening. And so we are a council that believes in it and understand all the reasons that you shared tonight. That's why gardening is so important in our community. So thank you for the work that you do in community gardens. Thank you. And I think it started with you here in city council. I also brought a letter from Patrick uh, he was not able to be here tonight, but he did want, is it okay if I leave this with someone to pass out to council members? Thank you. Thank you again. Our next speaker will be Rob Alexander, then it will be Jordan Davis, and then Ernest Perry. Good evening, Mr. Alexander. Good evening, President Pro Tem. Tyson and members of the Columbus City Council. My name is Rob Alexander. Um, as the Executive Director of the Human Service Chamber of Franklin County, I'm here tonight to speak on behalf of the 55 human service agencies that we represent. Um, and in some ways, maybe for the entire human service sector here in Columbus. 
It's important to me that I start off by saying thank you to each of the city council members who have all been very receptive and supportive of the efforts of our, that our members are taking to make Columbus a better place to live, work, and to raise a family. <clears throat> and to you especially, uh, Council Member Tyson, for being a staunch advocate so, for so many of our city's nonprofit organizations. Last year, the city of Columbus provided funding through a competitive grant process to more than 30 human service agencies, a majority of which are members of the human service chamber. To anyone listening, uh, this should tell you a couple of things. One, that the city realizes that there are challenges here in Columbus that a government program alone cannot address. And two, that they believe that the nonprofit community may be best suited to address these challenges. If either of these two things were not true, then there would have been no need to create the grant program. After touring so many of our, or our member agencies and speaking with their talented leaders, I can assure you that your confidence is well-founded. Each one of these agencies truly understands how to stretch a dollar to change a life. Now, imagine what they can do when they join forces and begin working together to solve some of our community's most vexing problems. Through their collective impact, perhaps neighborhoods in Columbus can slowly become more integrated, a place where it's not unusual to see high-income families living in low-income neighborhoods where poor folks live and indeed thrive amongst wealthier neighbors. When our members are all moving in the same direction, perhaps we can finally connect the 20,000 young adults who are neither in school or working with the large number of jobs that go unfilled each year because there simply aren't enough qualified people to place in them. Yes, job creation is important, it's vital, but if we can't fill those jobs, then those jobs are pointless. So let's make sure that our city is one that's teaching people the soft skills that they're gonna to need to function in today's workforce. Let's be a city that makes it easier for people to get to and from a good job. Let's be a city that gives people a second chance to succeed rather than placing them in a situation in which there's little hope that things will ever get better. With the city's support at $93,700, we can address these two issues, economic segregation, an employee mismatch. Does the Human Service Chamber have ambitious goals? Yes, and I don't apologize for that. We're gonna tackle the hard issues because we're custom built to drive smart, coordinated, and community-wide efforts that can move the needle. The way I see it, if our talented collection of agency leaders cannot collectively accomplish something, who can? I'm excited and humbled to lead this organization. I'm very much looking forward to continuing our strong relationship with the City of Columbus. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Alexander, for coming down and appreciate the work of all the agencies that are in the Human Service Chamber and all agencies that are working to help better the lives of the residents of our community. So thank you for coming down. Thank you. Good, good evening, Jordan. Good evening. Council Member Tyson and members of council, um, thank you for having us and thank you for your continued support of the Create Columbus Commission. Um, we are in a position today where we are stronger than ever because of your early investment in our work. And I hope that moving forward, we're going to, I hope that we have your partnership to continue to invest. We've identified one of our top or the top priority for us is looking at the impacts of student loan debt on our generation. Uh, we believe that it presents a real economic threat to the future of our city and the future of our economy and believe that there's things that we can do locally to help solve this problem. To help us move forward to getting to that point, we would like to commission a study to look at the degree of student loan debt that exists within this community and to understand best practices around the country that are done at a local level and also to understand the limitations that student loan debt causes on what young people can part do to participate in the economy. So it, we know now it's a barrier to entrepreneurship. We know it delays home ownership and wealth creation. And we think that if we have a better handle on what the local situation is, that will make better informed decisions moving forward. So we would love your investment to help us make this research study possible. Community research partners will be doing the study. Um, we are also working with civic um, and private sector partners to help make this possible, and we hope that the city is a significant partner in that as well. So 
If you have any questions, be happy to take them, but thank you. Councilman Hardin. Thank you, Chair Tyson, and, and uh, thank you, Jordan, for coming down in your work, uh, leading the Create Columbus Commission. Uh, I had opportunity to look at the pros. I had a question. Sure. Um, one, would you identify the amount uh, that you're requesting from the city uh, to support the study, and then the, that in proportion to outside funding, so your overall budget for this study? Yes. Uh, uh, so the overall budget for the study is $60,000. We're asking the city for 15, um, specific to the study. We, the commission, has voted to award one of our grants, uh, research grants, towards the study. Um, and then we will match the other half with private and nonprofit commitment. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman Hardin. And certainly I'm glad that you're working with co community research partners and yes. we help fund them too. So great. I'm glad you're working with them. And uh, you're right. Student debt is certainly all the th comments that you just made, uh, certainly our deterrent for young people moving forward. So thank you. And thank you for thinking about uh, the study. Yes, thank, thank you. you. Thanks for coming down. Mm -hmm. Mr. Perry. Good evening, uh, Council President Pro Tem Tyson, uh, Council Member Page, Council Member Hardin, Council Member Brown. Um, it's always a privilege to stand before you as hands on Central Ohio's CEO, and thank you for the longstanding support and partnership we've enjoyed with this council and with the City of Columbus. Uh, today, we, we stand in support of funding uh, for hands on Central Ohio and this partnership to provide. Uh, this city's two-on-one information and referral system, which provides easy coordinated access to emergency resources, uh, material assistance, uh, including emergency food access for residents in the city of Columbus. Uh, we also last year received additional funding from the Emergency Human Service Fund to launch a mobile phone-based text uh, service that provided uh, phone-based access for residents in Linden, Franklinton Hilltop and the south side of Columbus. In the first year of operating that service, we achieved some very important milestones in partnership with you. Uh, we provided access to over 200,000 uh, emergency meals, which represents a 17% increase over the prior year for food in those three or four communities I just named. Uh, we also increased the overall emergency food service access in central Ohio by more than 50,000 meals and that was our goal when we set out on this program. And this represents uh, a 17% increase in the entire uh, food access system over 2014. Despite these achievements, the number of Columbus residents in need of community resources, material assistance, and most of all emergency food continues to grow. Uh, and uh, emergency food is, is perhaps the most important of all these needs. Hands-On's board of directors has just completed and adapted a new strategic plan designed to better address the growth of poverty in Columbus neighborhoods. Uh, and it's illustrated by some of the data that I'm sure we've all seen. Uh, we have created targeted plans specific to emergency food access. Uh, and I would like to leave copies of these plans for you here tonight. It includes an outline of a request for an additional $276,000 in the budget to sustain the work that we've already done and then expand our mobile phone-based text access service to the entire city of Columbus, making it possible for every resident to use their cell phone um, to get access to emergency food. And we, we see this need to be perhaps most acute right now on the east and far east sides of Columbus. Uh, the need for Columbus residents to access resources is currently straining our, our community capacity to respond. We believe we, we've outlined a sustainable strategy to meet the current demand and also keep pace with the trends that we are forecasting. Uh, we thank you for considering our request and the time with you here tonight. And I'm always available to uh, talk to you at your convenience about any of the items that I'm leaving. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Perry, and just really appreciate um, just your organization coming up with um, mobile text service and certainly you certainly have shared the results of that and the, and the pilot was in those most vulnerable communities which we are really focused on and just really appreciate that work and then again you're mentioning the east and the far east side there's a, certainly a need for your services there so thank you for coming down and and 
make sure you present your presentation, your, your um, study to our staff. So we, thank you. Thank you. Mr. John Tolbert from Primary One Health, and then Olethea Wall, and then Marie Moreland Short. And that will conclude our speakers. Good evening, Councilman Tyson and other members of the council. My name is uh, John Tolbert, and I'm the Director of Community Services for Primary One Health. Uh, I just wanted to, on behalf of uh, our CEO, Charlita Tavares, come here tonight just to say thank you for your ongoing support uh, and funding for Primary One Health, along with the uh, support uh, of Columbus Public Health through Dr. Teresa Long. Um, you all know how long you all have been supporting and funding uh, Primary One Health for a number of years. And we just wanted to inform you that we are greatly appreciative of the ongoing support for the many, many, many people in this community that need health services that provide them the opportunity to become healthier citizens. Real briefly, I just want to say that one of the things that we've been focusing on and have accomplished uh, in the last year is expanding some of our specialty services, such as behavioral health, pharmacy counseling, nutrition for and di diabetics, uh, cardiology, and dermatology, physical therapy, and we're now working on a pilot program to expand the services for healthcare for the homeless. We will be launching a program shortly uh, that we call recuperative care, which simply is if a homeless individual is hospitalized and is discharged and needs a few more days to recuperate, he or she will be able to be in this facility for three days and will provide recuperative care. There's no sense of sending them back to the uh, shelter if they just need a couple of days to recuperate. The other thing that, uh, of course, you know, we, we, we changed our name to Primary One from formerly Columbus, Columbus Neighborhood Health uh, Center. And uh, we've been able in the past year to really do more outreach in the community through our certified community health outreach workers. Uh, they have been able to provide residents with access to uh, insurance via either Medicaid or the Affordable Care Act. Um, I can safely say that we uh, assisted over 3,000 uh, members in our community um, in assisting in getting insurance uh, and or Medicaid in this community. Uh, the other thing that we've been able to do is to provide ongoing interpreting services. Um, I'm sure most of you are aware that our immigrant population continues to grow. Uh, there are over 126 languages spoken in this city alone and we provide any of our clients who are immigrants, who are LEP patients, non-English speaking individuals, with interpreting services so they can also get the type of health care that they need. Um, basically, we're looking for uh, uh, ongoing and continuing support by council and uh, the health department in making sure that every resident in this city has the opportunity to have access to affordable health care. And we at Primary One have a mission of making sure that we provide quality health care for everyone that is uh, looking or seeking for that. Our focus is on wellness, and we'll continue to do that, and making sure that we keep everyone apprised of the successes that we're having, and we just want to thank you again for your ongoing and continued support. Thank you, um, thank you. Mr. Tolbert, for coming down, and certainly is a great partnership between the City of Columbus and Primary One, and just appreciate your work, and certainly, um, your CEO, Ms. Tavares' work. Could you share a little bit more with me about the health care for the homeless? So someone is homeless, is in the hospital, and still needs to recuperate. So where, where do they go to do that? Okay, let me, let me give you a little quick background on our health care for the homeless program. We have for years uh, been funded to provide health care for the homeless. Any individual that's homeless can be, be provided health care at any one of our centers. What we've started, um, looking into was the fact that there are a number of individuals that are hospitalized who are homeless and they are discharged. They, they may have a, a wound that just needs some aftercare. Uh, rather than them going back to a campsite or into the shelter, this uh, program will allow them to recuperate uh, in one of the, the centers that we've chosen uh, for three or four days. We've had cooperation from the hospitals. They've donated beds, nightstands, and so those individuals will be seen by a, um, a, a doc, a provider of ours, uh, to make sure that they are recovering and then released. Um, this is something that we are in the pilot stages of, and hopefully uh, 
um, by March 1st, we'll be implementing that program here in Columbus uh, at the Van Buren Center. Thank you. I'm very excited about that. So uh, please appreciate keep, it. Please um, make sure you keep us informed about that because we all know that when someone is ill and has to be hospitalized, mm -hmm. that when, I mean, you, they take care of the acute issue while you're right. in the hospital, right. but then you have to come out of the hospital <laughs> to continue to move forward. And right. so you think about our homeless, homeless um, residents, that they don't have an opportunity to, but to go back to a shelter and possibly not get those services they're needed. Right. So very excited about this new initiative and look forward to hearing more about it. Well, I personally want to thank you because you've always been a supporter of health care. So. Councilmember Mitchell Brown. Yeah. Well, it's, 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 it's a problem, but it's not a huge problem. It's a needed uh, a service for a number of individuals that are coming out of the hospital with no place to go to recuperate. Um, I can't give you a number, but it's, it's needed. Here's the good thing. Um, we probably will be the only city in Columbus that offers um, in Ohio. I think Cincinnati may have a startup program as well, but we'll be the first in Columbus to offer recuperative care for our homeless individuals. So it's, it's not a huge problem, but it's a needed service. Okay. Thank That's you. a good question. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Mr. Wall. Good evening. <clears throat> Uh, good evening, Council. Uh, thank you for your time. Um, my name is Olitha Wall, and I work in the, in the APPS program. Uh, it's a conglomeration of different organizations, CND, the Urban League, and the support of Parks and Recs. Uh, I serve as the team lead for one arm of the APPS program. And what we do in the APPS program specifically is engage with youth between the ages of 14 and 23 with the purpose of redirecting some of those uh, youth who are either gang involved or who are not in school, who are unemployed, generally underserved and uh, disenfranchised. And so uh, as a result, we've had some significant successes. But before I go there, let me say why this is so important to me. I've been a lifelong resident of Columbus, Ohio, and in my youth, I made some choices that put me at odds with the law, that put me at odds with my family, that put me at odds with even my own survival. And so after uh, paying my debt to society, subsequently I was incarcerated, I came home and I saw the condition of the community and I was blessed, I say, with the opportunity to do this work. So over, this, over the past five years, a little more than five years, we have had some significant impacts in our city. One, of, one I'll highlight three. Uh, two that affect the community as a whole, and one is just an individual case that is dear to me. Uh, at this year, 2015's Red, White, and Boom celebration, there were no significant fights. If there was a fight, it might have been between, but traditionally, since I've been a child in Columbus, we have had fights at Red, White, and Boom every year. Now, based on the, and because of the leadership of the city of Columbus, in Whitehall, at the very same time in 2014, six officers went to the hospital. In 2015, this year, no officers went to the hospital because of the presence of our intervention team at the Whitehall celebration, because we had intelligence that let us know that instead of coming to Columbus's celebration, they would go to Whitehall. In addition, at the 2012 Ohio State Fair, we had the assistance of the State Highway Patrol, which prevented an all-out gang war on Cleveland Avenue. They allowed me personally to take a group of young people through a restricted area to safety so that we wouldn't jeopardize those young people or the citizens of Columbus. And just to close, I have a young man who will be interviewing with us this evening, who I first engaged on Whittier and Oakwood, who was essentially a gang leader who was there calling shots, as we call it, directing young people in foolishness, and he will be interviewing with us this evening for a position saving lives. So I thank you, um, Finance Chair uh, Tyson. I thank you, Chair of Parks and Recs, uh, Jaisa Page. I thank you, Councilman Harmon, Councilman Brown. Thank you. 
Thank you, Councilmember Page. Any comments or questions? I would just like to thank you, Olita. Um, we call you Brother O, and yes, just because of the work that you're doing in the APPS program and just your heart and passion for the young people and to thank Councilman Hardin for being a part of the initial group who started APPS and understood the issues that our young people are facing and giving people like you the opportunity to give back to our community. So again, just thank you, and we look forward to the work that you'll continue to do under Director Collins. And if I may, uh, I only represent a, a group of people who do this job, so I'm just here to represent them, but there are a lot of people working behind the scenes who would give, who g daily put their lives on the line um, for this work, and they're passionate, if not more so than I am. Thank, Thank you. you for coming down, and certainly um, this is in our budget for 2000, the budget for 2016. I also just want to commend you and your work also working with the, the Columbus Police Department, yes, because we know it takes, it, it, it takes a lot of individuals and groups to be able to ensure that everyone has, in this city has an opportunity, I'm always saying, to be able to kind of live, to the, live their life's potential. And part of it is by making sure we're keeping people safe. And so we definitely need different strategies in order to do that. And so the APPS program is certainly one. There's a number of them that we utilize. But again, thank you for working and uh, even going to Whitehall and making sure that, that there weren't issues there just because as you care about the young people in our community. So I just appreciate the work that you're doing. Yes, ma'am. And I just wanted to say thank you to our law enforcement partners because it's been a stretch for them to accept people like me who, when we were once at odds and to trust us and allow us to do this work. So I, I have been privileged to watch them grow alongside this program. So I would like to thank our law enforcement partners as well. Thank, thank you for coming down. Our next speaker is Marie Moreland Short. Okay. I know she was in council chambers on Monday, but she's not here this evening. Thank you. And then um, our final speaker will be Mr. Tim Jones. Good evening, Mr. Jones. The floor is yours. Hello, my name is Tim Jones. Um, I go to The Ohio State University. I'm a Bob and Missy Weiler Scholar. I'm a junior. so. Um, I'm basically here on behalf of MBK Task Force. I had the honor to serve with the task force uh, through the last summer. We've been doing some great work with the students. Um, one of the problems that we want to address is mentorship. So one of the things that we found in our study is that education is num the number one obstacle for living a happy, healthy life for the children, but it's also something that they feel is not relevant in their lives. So. We need positive relationships and exposure to positive programs. We have over 100,000 black males in the community of Columbus, Ohio. We have over 3,000 black students at OSU. So these are resources. And they're not just resources, they're power. So I believe that we need to come together as a city with the members of our community to let them know not only are we here to help, but we need their help. Um, I propose that we start mentorship programs to be able to help people who are not students but grown men who are willing to give back to the community, giving them a second chance to be able to help and share their past, share their experiences, to, and to also serve as a pipeline through OSU so that we can have our students, our black male students, right here I have my, my, my uh, classmate Samuel, my classmate Ed. We represent a very big majority of uh, black male students who are interested in mentorship. Um, you would be surprised how many freshmen and sophomores alone are willing to share their experiences of what they're going through and they're just starting their college experiences. So um, I believe that whatever funds that you have, the maximum needs to be given. Um, Obama himself wanted the, every city to leverage their existing funds and I believe that this city has always been in support of black males, but there's a crisis. And I believe that if we're not looking at it as a crisis, then more and more black male students will be born into this city and they're going to be going through the same problems that I had to escape from, that we had to escape from, and it's very difficult. So I believe that starting programs to help first the black males that are in this, in this city, over 100,000, 100,000 men who we don't know where they are, they don't know where they are, and, and they, they're looking for something to be able to, to, to grasp onto. Um, I'm a man of the word, and one of my favorite Bible verses is we perish with a lack of knowledge. And there are just many people out there that just don't know that their help is needed. 
and I believe that the funds should go to letting people know that there's, there's help needed, to helping them become mentors because not everyone is mentor ready, to establish mentorship programs to let them learn how to lead, learn how to become leaders, and to be able to learn how to touch children so that one day the future, coming through OSU, the mentorship programs that are already in existence will be able to keep the pipeline going so that we have a, a large majority of mentorship mentee relationships that establishes unity in our community. Because when black people move in this country, the world sees it. Civil rights is a great example. Police violence is another big example. I believe that Columbus moving on this with the black community can change the world. Thank you. Can you also introduce or speak? There are um, the other young men that are with you. Hi, my name is uh, Samuel Osfaha. I'm a junior at The Ohio State University. I'm a moral scholar uh, from the Office of Diversity and Inclusion. Where are you from? I'm from Rockville, Maryland. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Hello, uh, I'm Edward Watts. I'm a third year junior at Ohio State and I'm from Dallas, Texas. Thank you. And, and Mr. Jones, can you tell me where, you, where are you from? I'm from Columbus, Ohio. Columbus, Ohio. Yes. Brit Thank I live on Brittanelle, Brittanelle Avenue. I'm Brittany. Thank you. Councilmember Harden. Thank you again, Chair Tyson, uh, President Pro Tem Tyson. I uh, just want to thank Tim and thank the, the brothers that, are, that came out this evening. Um, Tim, you gave a lot of time over the last year, <coughs> excuse me, to the uh, My Brother's Keepers Task Force, uh, doing the deep dives and doing the meetings, going out and participating in the forums where we engage uh, the hundreds and hundreds of young men. Uh, in our community and so I am uh, extremely uh, uh, grateful I've told you before that I learn from you uh, when, when you speak and when you, when you engage folks and so uh, I want to thank my my council colleagues for their support uh, of the my brother's keepers task force and um, just make that continued uh, promise on behalf of the city that we are we are there that we're going to continue to work um, that I will work with our colleagues to uh, identify see what resources we can um, uh, allocate, like you said, uh, President Obama challenged us to leverage against existing resources and uh, programs, initiatives. So this is a community-wide effort. And so whatever we will be able to do will be just a small part of what we hope to leverage uh, throughout the rest of the community. So thank you for your leadership. Thank you for being a leader on, on campus, uh, but also just in the city in general. So I appreciate you, brother. And I would just like to say thank you again, especially to Councilmember Harden, for just giving me the opportunity um, being from Columbus, uh, going through Columbus City Schools, I can tell you personally, I've only been here twice. Um, but to see the presence, the African American presence on the city council is something that not only touches me, but I feel would touch hundreds of thousands of students to be able to see that maybe some people look at us as if we can't succeed, but it's here. The city of Columbus is an excellent example of of what it means when you have black excellence. And OSU, I think, really speaks to it. I think our, our retention rate for our first years is one of the highest in the country, thanks to Dr. Moore. And I think that partnering with OSU, um, just bringing unity to the community and the school, one of the biggest institutions in the state, around education really breeds an environment of success. If you have black males from all across the city gathered together at a university, a place of knowledge, a place of education, I don't see what could go wrong. So again, I appreciate everyone here. Uh, thank you. Again, thank you for coming down and certainly sharing um, the need for funding for My Brother's Keeper. I want to thank Councilmember Hardin for his um, work in making sure that we had a My Brother's Keepers program in the city of Columbus, and certainly there is a need. I appreciate the words you're saying, there is a crisis, and we know there is a crisis just because of what all is going on with pe young people of color. So we thank you for coming down. We look forward to this community coming together and addressing this, addressing this issue so that, again, everyone has this opportunity to reach their full potential. Thank you for your work, and thank you, young men. I know you are, you are leaders already, and, um, and you're wanting to help others. So thank you so much because Martin Luther King said everyone can be great because everyone can serve. And thank you for your service already. Thank you so much for coming down. This so those are those, the final speakers for tonight's hearing. And just want to say that this budget places a high priority on a couple of areas. Safety, will continue to maintain the number of uniformed officers and firefighters 
and funding a community summer safety initiative. It also focuses on education. The, the city continues to make the education of our youth a priority as beginning a new initiative to support education advocacy, focusing on developing a highly skilled and entrepreneurial workforce, the Future Ready Program, and also health, providing funding for the harm reduction program that addresses the opiate use. I want to thank everyone who has come to present the budget this evening. What makes Columbus an exceptional city is the great people that are in it. We value your input and on important matters such as the city budget. The budget is on council's agenda to be amended this Monday, the February the 1st, and with passage on Monday, February the 8th. Before we conclude, I want to thank our, the staff and the finance department for their hard work on this budget. I want to thank my fellow council members and their staffs, again, who serve our community with pride every single day. I want to thank the city council's legislative research office, especially Michael Kessler, who, who leads the legislative, legislative research team, and Matt Erickson, who staffs the finance team. I also want to thank Nicole Harper and James Lewis from my staff, and again, the hardworking staff of CTV, because without CTV, our residents who cannot be in the audience today would not have the opportunity to be able to, uh, to, be able to see and hear the workings of Columbus City Council. And lastly, I always want to thank our residents who allow us to serve. And we thank you, and with that, I want to say good night, and this hearing is adjourned.